Who's this fool? Okay, I think now is about a good time to begin. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Red Wheelbarrow Poetry Society. Our invited poet this evening is Team House Fongu Jesu, who is a writer and publisher at the New Generation Publishing Company in Peter Maritzburg. Thank you, Team House, for joining us this evening. Um, I think we'll be hearing some work from his debut collection called Bury Me Naked, and hopefully some work from his um, second collection that I believe is going to be published sometime this year. Um, Tim Howe, if you want to introduce yourself in, in, on, uh, if you want to introduce yourself, you're more than welcome to. I'm going to be sharing his poems on the screen. Um, let me just try and do that. And then we can, I don't know, this one, here we go. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, with regards to the introduction, uh, I think you have done a very fantastic job. Uh, my name is Tim Howe. I live in Malter. I write there. I work there. Yeah, I think you said most of the things. Uh, and I start with the reading. Yes, you may. Is it is it big enough on the screen? Uh, I will be reading from the. Okay, book. you'll be reading. This is for. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Ready when you are. Okay. Uh, the first poem that I will read is titled "The Beginning." Uh, the beginning. It happened in October nineteen ninety five. Behind in rent by a month or three, my father, the beast, kept demanding that mother pay the rent. Drunk in October, his imprecise compliments were for the first time greeted with a smile. He demanded to be let in. For the first time, she let him in. When inside, again, he demanded to be let in. She again let him in. He slept there. A few weeks pass. She tells him she's pregnant. He doesn't want to believe it. This would be his turn. But he could not keep her out. He knew her situation. She was 25. This was her fault. She didn't have a job. I was born. Shortly after, she falls pregnant again. My father was not the father. He kicked all of us out. I opened my eyes for the first time when I was five. I had five siblings, all of us living with our mother in a one room house at Zimbabwe University. That exact day, I met the father who impersonated her, who was on top of her, in front of all six of us, knowing exactly we were only pretending. The second one is titled, They Just Threw Me Here. I am a result of two people's uncontrollable libido. A way could have prevented it all. Instead, they went for it, so throwing me here in the deepest water, telling me nothing, absolutely nothing. They did not tell me I had to tell with my legs and move my hands in a certain motion to stay afloat. They didn't tell me how to hold my breath and deep under, and how to use my mouth when up. They just threw me here, expecting me to see for myself like they saw for themselves. Now nothing can be taken back or undone. Now all I can do is fold my arms and sink, and sink, hoping the ground is nearer. Hoping my case will soon be done, 
I would see my mother smoking something too pain of, and I would think never will you see me doing that. I would see my grandmother and uncle drinking together. I would think never will you see me doing that. Upon their death, I went to live with my father, a heavy smoker and drinker. I would listen to him coughing in the toilet and in his room every single day and think never will you see me doing that. I would watch him closely when he was drunk. He would struggle to walk, talk, or even open his lips. I would watch him start unnecessary fights, being laughed at, wasting money he didn't have. I would watch him forget his name, my name, our name, every name. I would watch him fall in love with women who I knew he wouldn't have fallen for sober. Sometimes I would watch him beat them up throwing their belongings outside our yard. Never would you see me doing that, I would say to myself gently. As my father and I grew older, our personalities changed places. By then I had done all the things I said I would never do. But still, I would look at my father and say, never will you see me doing that. He changed, he stopped drinking completely got rid of all his friends, took no female on earth seriously, started hating everyone and keeping them at a distance. He never took a big risk again for any reason. He never got involved in other people's problems, no matter how, how minor they were, how much time he had. Now I sit here thinking that so many of those neighbors have already done, and I don't see a reason not to do that right. The next home is actually the funeral. I remember my mother, my two sisters, my best friend, my father, like it was yesterday, like it was today. I can still feel their last presence. I can still see their close eyes and the forced expressions that the cops seen as put on their faces to hide their indifference. I remember everything, and God knows that's enough to prepare me for my I to go silent. Go silent. I don't want visitors. They will see me struggle with my God silent. They will see me wrestle with him, sometimes down, sometimes up, sometimes running away from myself and him, sometimes hiding at the corner of my imagination, my face facing the wall. I don't want friends. They make me forget my God silent. They open my mouth and I become a gaping crocodile. The fastest love parted my life so more than that comes. I swim in ocean of both continents. I don't want to love her. She will want me to love her more than I love my God. I will burst and break into a million pieces trying to keep both of them. I don't want anyone in my family. They always want to show me their God or words. Remind me of what he can do. My God lives in a third state, and that's where I want to be. They hate my God. They say he doesn't answer. He is silent. True, he is silent. He never answers. The following one uh, I will tell me naked. Bury me naked. When I'm dead, bury me naked. Facing the opposite direction of the correct direction with my coffin and eyes wide open. Throw the dust straight in my face. Use stones and bricks while at it. When half done, throw rubbish. Take a 
shape on the penis is in the China T and C inside like you did on me and my main. Bend down, leave. Don't put any head on or try to make it look different. People should know and not know who it belongs to. Let them take a while care. That shouldn't be a problem. They are familiar with making guesses. Following one is and cup all the angels. And cuff all the angels and torture them however you want. Send them to get back all the blessings they have unfairly distributed. Be strong, God. Throw him in jail and don't allow him any visitors. Starve him. Hang his son, Christ. Not his portrait, rosaries, or doctors, but him. Hang him again and put all the nails, not in his hands, but in his neck. Hang him from the ceiling of the highest of the cloud. Baptize him with boiling chemicals. Pour petrol and paraffin on the floor of heaven. Set it alive. Let there be no difference between hell and heaven. No time shall be wasted reading any scripture or kneeling or closing one's eyes. Fighting and running is all they shall be time for. Next one is actually there is more to lie. My girlfriend is lying next to me, dead drunk. We have made love three times since we arrived in my room in the middle of this cold night. On all three occasions, she didn't react to me being invited. She didn't wake up, she didn't move, she didn't make the sound. I said snoring or pencil her feet. Tomorrow I know, however, she will remind me of everything and kiss me and thank me with a kiss on my forehead. I never know exactly what she thanks me for, whether it's for providing her with food for late and late night accommodation or for the sweating I do during the night. Nights like this remind me of my English teacher back in school who used to stare at me for a long time and day after till the start. There is more to life than death rather than passion. I always wanted to ask him, like what? Following one is titled My Day. It used to belong to my father, now it belongs to me. It used to be soft, now it's not. It knows my most sober dream and my most drunk dream and all the other dreams in between. The dreams I dream of the time I reflect my discomfort. It knows my heart's deepest sorrow, my insane moments of temporary bliss, my addictions and habits. I have written a thousand poems and stories by smoking on its lap. It's aware of everything inside my head and heart. It knows all my embarrassing secrets and shame to me lately. I feel sorry for it sometimes. It knows what pain is. It knows what depression is. My father watered it with his tears for many years when his body was filled with sickness and pain. When he was wasting away to nothing. When he could see all his bones. When he was about to go to the world of the dead. This bird doesn't only know bugs, it knows all kinds of other animals too. Animals more dangerous, animals you wouldn't believe as you. Animals that look at exactly like me. It has been burned a thousand times with cigarette ashes. It has been teeth, vomited, and fed on. I don't know about shit. Maybe it has been it too. I don't know. When I think about it, surely it contains saying. Tim Howe is always on top of me. This is no longer love, punishment and abuse. If it could push me to the floor, it would have done so long ago. And if it wasn't the biggest thing in the room, we would hide and make sure I don't find it. The next one is titled 
by substance y substance so we can forget that we are not happy forget that we have dreams that we never come to forget that we are misunderstood that the ones we love will never love us and we stand up in prayer that we could share um, so that we can forget the good people who passed on and so we can tolerate the evil ones still alive so we can forget the guilt, the disappointment, the incurable diseases that beat us, the dysfunction in our family, and the parents who never loved us. So we can forget that we are hopeless and helpless. So we can slow down the speed of our insecure thoughts. So we can drown the voices that keep telling us we won't amount to anything. Of course. We know reality is pushed away and that goes closer. Our attention, our intention, however, is to live while they still time and to live fully. Second one. Is dream, dream set in heaven. Dream set in heaven. With my two friends, during a quiet sermon, one of their hands plays around Christ's cell phone and that number. When he starts looking for these things, it's the real Kelly. Everyone suggests that he be success. God's two called the builder angels without hesitation said the stolen items are found. And other shiny items I didn't know were there. An assault begin. An assault was given than the one received by Christ back in his day. I try to run, they catch me. The assault begins again. I wake up coughing and turn on the light. Not glad I was coughing, just my usual saliva. The next one is prayer during sleep. Oh, beautiful God, as your unthinking eyes have seen, it's decay after decay, darkness after darkness, sorrow, misery, tears, and helplessness, hustle after hustle. Oh, gracious God, please open your ears to my cry. Or at least the noises in my stomach. The long time that this man has stood in the rain without any sign of sunshine. His umbrella was taken long ago by the Dear God, enemy of bad actions and thoughts, the rightful punisher of those who deserve punishment, the rightful exerting creditor who doesn't listen to story because he says they are all the same. God who is fair and justice, who watches with careful eyes to discern the error of men. O oh, owner of heaven, there is no good this thing can fit me anymore. Try to understand my case and soften your hand on my throat. The next one is SGP. The big mute bouncer at the door. The boys who play cool whole day and dance to every guitar they took off the post of tape. The old man drinking cheap beer by himself in the corner. The always drunk uncle who never needs anyone to dance with. The other uncle who no longer hides the conversation to be paid. The new guy who Drunk, but tries to look like he's in control. The other drunk guy who touches everyone elsewhere. The guy who doesn't drink but is always there. The loud, energetic guy who always who, who talks and laughs across the room. The shy, awkward guy who feels big before being there. The man in suit at the counter and the one they drunk on the toilet floor. The confused intellectual who doesn't stop talking and the ones next to 
team who are laughing, hiding their own confusion. The educated one, the young child whose short hands can't reach the counter, but who will be served because they know his mother. The church goer who comes every Saturday afternoon to buy church wine, the bar lady who keeps them all buying, the cleaner who knows everything, the dirty guy collecting plates and bottles at the back, who was once the biggest spender in this same bar. The next one is Lecture Manifesto. I will come visit your little shop, wash your smelly feet, hold your dirty nose, running, shit smelling children, buy you a grocer, grocery of no importance, give you t shirts to wear when you go to town, push your disabled son to your chair and pretend never to tire. I will tell my bodyguard not to push, beat, or shoot you. I will ask you what you need, make you touch it, feel it, but that should be all. I have a mention to get back to, parties and dates to attend, and the exotic car to drive. I am talking a new convertible Porsche Cabriolet whose waist ends at my hip, and the latest Range Rover, bigger than every shop I've seen here. The next one is titled Leadership. They dress in clothes you'll never see in stores. Sleep in hotels you don't know exist. Eat food you cannot imagine. When meat is stuck between their teeth, dentists get involved. Their wine is so expensive you can buy a vehicle with just a single bottle. They are the ones who own the farms you see on the freeway. Hectares next to hectares. They also own everything in the city. They have interests deep down in mind and deep down in the sea. An interest up high in the sky, in planes, networks, satellites. They know where the next road, school, clinic, mall will be built and for how much. The list of money they deal with is too long for a cheap calculator. They buy motor vehicle after motor vehicle, have houses on top of houses, with infinite views to the horizon, swimming pools only a few meters smaller than the ocean. Their children know nothing about the state of hardship. Things remain like this till they die of a serious unknown illness, suffered only by blue corn. The poor love them, they make them rich. They wave their hands for them at unnecessary meetings, conferences, and rallies, and sometimes necessary for cases. They kill each other for them. Newspapers are full of their scandals, but people choose to ignore those. Wait, on second thought, maybe I should too. The next one, title, The Lament of the Poor Man. Times are tough, stress is high, children are sick, there's no food in the house. At the supermarket, my self esteem is old. So sorry to um, disturb and interrupt, Tim Hao. Do you mind just starting Lament of Poor Man again? We just had a slight disruption. Sorry? sorry? Could you please start Lament of a Poor Man um, again? Oh, we just sorry. lost you for a second. Thank you.
Can you give me just? Oh, I'm Yes, yes, of course. Um, you you just start when you're ready. Just maybe pop a message in the box. You just want to maybe talk for one sec for a few seconds. I can just hear if it's uh, okay. I'm back. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm back. I'll start okay. again. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Okay. This one is titled Lament of a Poor Man. Said I must read it again. Okay. Times are tough, stress is high, children are sick, there is no food in the house. At the supermarkets, my self esteem is always at its lowest. Always feels like it's me against the greedy guys, the greedy businessmen and women who own the stores, my greedy boss and the greedy government who doesn't regulate this robbery. What drops my self-esteem is the prices. Most of them I cannot believe. How much is the maize meal? Sugar, the brown one too, beans. There's no food in the house. I'm getting way below minimum wage. My boss enjoys reminding, reminding me I don't deserve the money he's giving me. He says he can go to the streets and grab the first non-South African flag and pay him half of what he's paying me. He wants me to hate my fellow brother, but I won't. I'll just keep working like a slave and pray he doesn't carry out his threat. The money I'm getting is too little. How will I pay the long list of people I have to pay? How will I get to work till the end of this beginning month? How will I avoid not borrowing more? Times are tough and the whole room needs, and the whole roof needs fixing. Rain has ruined all the furniture inside. The next one is titled, Waking Up for School. Cold wind making its way through the broken windows. Rain pouring in from the holes in the corrugated iron roof. Nongrebo and her crew and the group next to her have to move their old shaky desk to the other side. There are no textbooks, only the teacher has them and no one knows if she has all of them. She used to teach life orientation, now she teaches math. Skumbuzo's stomach is making noise the boys not next to him are laughing. He thinks they are laughing at his shoes. There are 67 of us in this class. The school cannot afford other teachers. They can't afford anything. It's we who must pay for this later. Uh, the next one is titled Pondis is Kakan. Pondis is Kakan slept with the pepper spray next to his sponge and the hatchet and the teaser and the big decker under his pillow. His sleeping shoes were the strong leather construction safety shoes, laces tightly fastened, not even a smell could get out. He slept with the helmet on. He locked his room with two locks. He was tired of dreams fucking him up. During the day, he had two pistols on his waist, and the third one in his side bag, and the Rambo pocket knife in his pocket. After a short conversation with him, he had to search you. Unashamed, unashamedly, 
he would ask you to put your hands up and separate your legs. He always stayed sober and always looked over his shoulder. He was tired of reality fucking up. He was tired of everything and who could blame him? His side of the story was never known. The next one is the greatest sin. There is no sin greater than not having money. You don't need to go to hell to be punished for it. You get punished for it here on earth severely and you never get a chance to explain. The next one is early morning. Early morning. I've searched for a cigarette everywhere. I did not find one. I slept with the key hanging in the lock from outside. But that's not what bothers me. What bothers me is that I haven't found a cigarette. Thinking, calculating, calculating, thinking. As I have nothing to think about, my head tends to thinking about anything and everything. The people who said will catch me and slit my throat. The difficulties are underestimated and all the time spent on illusions. I fight a war like this most nights. I know the battle bit better than I know anything. In the morning, time takes its own time before it makes things clear. And I always ask myself, why does the sun have to rise? Why doesn't it just leave us alone in the dark? Next one is titled, My Bed with My Mother's Mother. Grown old, her pale skin could no longer take him a whole day's sunshine, nor stand the half minute of cold rain. Her eyes could no longer see as they used to, but they could see what she wanted them to see. Her ears couldn't hear could no longer take in the fast music she used to move so beautifully to. Her throat and liver could no longer take in the spirits they were so familiar with. She now only drank with her eyes and her imagination. Her feet, knees, hips, all grown stiff. The dances she used to excel at could no longer be performed. Everything could now only be done with just eyes. She sat and stared. It was poetry. When I started school, I could write my name, surname, and I could draw a cat. In grade one, teachers gave me poems to read and recite in front of visiting teachers. Though I couldn't read the English written inside, I couldn't play with anything else but books. In grade three, my sister and I used my father's desk as our office desk where a lot of our first writing took place. Grade six, I read The Rock and a Hard Place, a one voice trumpet story, the book about a small boy who got aid from his parents' drinking friends. I was in the same after. One of my stepsisters forgot her diary before she left for work. I didn't go to school that day. Her eyes were closed. Everyone's eyes were closed. Only I saw the poetry. The end of that same year, I walked from Peter Maris Beck CBD to M. Condon, shooters and shoot, shot and shooter publishers, 15 kilometers there and back with hundreds of handwritten pages. Topics like AIDS being rejected and triumphing over it. A senior employee called by the receptionist took the stack out of my hands and read it for a few seconds. Turned some pages and read for a few more seconds. He gave me my stack back, put his hand on my shoulder, smiled. You think too much. Go play with other kids, son, and enjoy yourself. You are still young, he continued to smile. 
turned around and left. Before he entered the big door that led to many other offices, he shouted, don't stop writing though. Grade seven, Miss Chetty, senior librarian at the C Head Library in Peter Marisburg, miraculously selected for me the kind of books that would get me hooked on reading forever and nothing else. I quit everything. I couldn't wait to see her at the end of every week. Grade nine, she looks at my library card through her eyeglasses, which were always at the tip of her nose and says, Bessie too was born in Peter Marisburg on my birthday, the 6th of July. I searched deeper. Bessie Head's mother passed away when she was six. My mother too passed away when I was six. Grade nine, Miss Lachit tells me I shouldn't do anything except write. I read my pieces to my uninterested friends every morning, every single morning. Grade 11, I read Antonia J. Salakovich's April Fool's Day. Life changed completely. I was certain. However, two years later, my father looks me, looked me straight in my eyes and asked me what I wanted to do with my future. My head and heart screamed poetry, but my mouth slowly said law. He smiled opened his wallet and gave me a fair to go and ask what was needed. He was sick. I couldn't say anything else. I put my head down four years, doing less reading, writing only a few poems. When it was time to find a job, however, I locked myself in my room and chose to read and write as I wanted, when I wanted, even though I starved. No one could tell me anything. My father, who could have told me something, was dead. It went on for years. I couldn't be stopped. I met a brilliant writer, forced a correspondence. It didn't work. I was suicidal. I lost my mind, find it again, lost it again. And one night, miraculously, I met an old man, Robert Birrell, who rescued me, told me, and showed me that things would be fine, that there was no need to draw in the towel. Oh, how I thank God repeatedly for that man. Simple though it sounds, that was poetry, the sweetest and the rawest my ears ever tasted. The next one is titled, To My Beautiful Ex. You call my writings a waste of time. You tell me nothing goes or comes anymore in my life. That I have reduced my life to staring at old pages written by old bitter dead men. You say you don't understand why I'm not like other men. Why I don't chase fame, money, acclaim for your friends. You say if my pens and papers were alcohol, you wouldn't by now have a liver or face. And if they were real work, we wouldn't have all these complications. You always shout and say, go and find a real job and work like other men. But you seem not to see that you are disturbing me while I'm really working. Next one is titled, Telling the Pages. I rush home to tell the pages my love has been rejected again. I get no motivation, no pet on the back, no counsel. Just a blank look staring straight in my red watery eyes. I try to speak louder, but it doesn't help. Oh dear God, what am I to be if even the pages reject me? The next one is titled My dirty room. To the ants that feed on my mistakes when I eat, the fast spiders that I always miss when I try to kill, the lizards that hide behind my father's photographs and my always incorrect wall clock, to the attention-seeking birds I share my mattress and pillows with, 
the flies in the kitchen, the big mosquitoes the size of a bed, the thousand cockroaches that wait for the light to be turned off, the rats that play with my mind and leave me seeing things that are not there, the fat snake under the sink and in snake cat. I see myself in all of you. Hope you see yourself in me too. We are in all this together. This poem is for you. The last one is titled, Death is on his way. Oh, okay. Like a lone shark is coming. No type of lock will deny him entry. You will regret that you never gave him the attention he deserves. You won't believe that all along he was fooling you putting you in a false sense of security so you did everything recklessly. You won't believe that none of it was ever free, though nothing was ever enough. You will beg, weep at his feet, make promises, admit your mistakes, ask for forgiveness, but soon you will realize you are talking to yourself. You will then call him names, show your anger and frown with your whole face, but he won't be disturbed. He will just stand there and give you his empty hand. And if you have wasted your time, no, he won't waste his. Thank you. Uh. Oh. Wow, Timo, geez, what a punch to the gut. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, sharing your work. Um, it was it was riveting. It was, yeah, it was quite remarkable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so what we usually do now is we, we take some questions or comments from, from the room, um, and that will only go on for about 10 minutes or so. Probably, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure there are many questions and, and comments. Um, if you perhaps could just raise your hand, I'll, I'll just you know, follow my screen. Um, I'm still gathering my thoughts and my questions. So I will ask um, in a little bit. Does anyone have any questions or comments for, for Team Hal? You can you can go for it, Jacques. So I, I was I was I was also still putting mine together. I was I was hoping I wouldn't go first, but but all right. That was that was extraordinary. That was that was a wonderful okay, reading. Reaction. Thank you. Control shift. Um, I'm I'm. There's something that really haunts me about the nakedness in Bury Me Naked, because it's the nakedness. Well, see, I don't want to answer the question that I'm <laughs> that I'm asking you, but it it feels like it's a it's a double edged thing, isn't it? Because it's nakedness of shame, but it's also the nakedness of no masks. Um, I wondered if you wanted to say something about that, whether I'm on the right track and how you, you know, how you came to, to choose that as the title for the book, because it's very strong. Uh, uh, I am influenced by kind of poems that are naked, that are straightforward, that go straight to the point that have nothing to hide. I've been reading that like since I was young. Uh, and yeah, that there is a, a certain kind of nakedness in the poems, and it's just my style. I write like that, and yes, and I feel that the more we are straightforward, and the more we avoid any sophistications, I feel like people will will feel free expressing themselves 
talking about these things that I talk about and being straightforward and feeling no shame in, in sharing them if somebody can share them like I did or and can be straightforward and not try to hide it as a, there is an intention behind it yeah you prove it as well yeah yeah um yeah and just if you if you'd like to say uh if you just like to name a, a few of the poets that are your favorites mm, yeah the, there are just so many uh it would be unfair to name uh, i would pass that question for now there are just so many so many yeah. most of the confessional gang and yeah I, i'm into that kind i'm into poetic I'm into political poets too i read a lot a lot i have a lot of them in my room right i don't know which one to pick uh, but i think that the first person to to do it on a high scale was silver plaque i think there's a woman who did it i think yeah she was the first one but there's sophistication in her uh, in her poetry it's sophisticated in that you cannot read it without having someone explain it to you that's where mine differs in that mine is straightforward you will read it and you will know everything that goes in there which as i said has an intention in it I really want everyone to start writing poetry. I want everyone to, to feel that they can do this, that poetry is for everyone. That is the intention and putting such subjects and topics in, into my work then allows everyone to think they do have something to say. And yeah, something. Thank you. That's, that's wonderful, thank you. Indeed, um, I, 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 I like what you said, um, Tim, how about, um, I mean, it's a kind of unpretentious language, you know, it's, it's, it's accessible, um, and I'm somebody who's very much interested in protest literature, and more, more short fiction, um, but we get we get that element of protest and resistance because it's deeply political in that it's concerned with the concerned with the politics of space and, and language yeah. and education and all of those sorts of things. Um, but apart from that, Tima, um, and apart from like the confessional elements, the Sylvia Plath, um, Plath yeah, that, that you mentioned, um, I wondered yeah. if when writing this project um, or putting this collection together, did you have like an imagined reader? Um, because I, I could just, you know, imagine the kind of effect that this kind of writing would have if it were taught, you know, maybe in matric or, um, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of learning that can happen through the through reading the work. So I wondered if you, if you, who, who did you sort of perceive in your in your mind's eye when you wrote this poem? So who's listening? You know, who's who's you know, questioning it and 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 thinking about it, analyzing it even? That's a yeah, strange question. I, I think <laughs> uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think maybe before like two or three years back, I always thought of my audience as people around my age. So that would be 22, 21. When I was 17, I thought of my audience as 17 year old. But now that the collection has been put together and I'm looking at it, I, I, I am aiming at young people in a way. I, I want to catch them young so that we can install this uh, respect for poetry and this desire to write early on. So it, the intention is there for people around high school, early university, those are the people I really want to to, to target. But even adults do uh, find that the work is at their level and, and that it speaks to them. And 
However, when I write, I don't think about anything. I just write and I write a lot. I don't think, I think I've written more than 2000 poems, 3000 poems, and I've never sat down once and said, who am I writing for? But, but I can remember that back then, I, I used to think everyone in the world was my age and just, but I've changed, yeah. Okay, yeah, and I suppose we, we write back to ourselves. You know, if you're yeah. writing at 17, you writing back to your 17 year old self. Um, thank you. Um, Ed. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Tim Hall, thank you very much for your reading. I love the directness of your writing. Um, and the way that you draw your listener or your reader into your world. Um, yeah, I, I also picked up on another thing and that is that you, you make room in your work for very contradictory emotions. Um, yeah, um, just an observation. Um, and I, what I was curious about is, is the, the, the process that you follow um it you you just said you know you've written a lot of poems so um i noticed the poem about the politician appeared in new coin and it was longer um and the version that uh, you you read tonight was was shorter and i think it was more punchy um as a result um i'm just curious as to the process you follow how you how you get the poems to where you're happy with them. Hmm. Uh, uh, when it comes to my process, uh, I'm more like island petting in that I believe that quality comes from a lot of quantity. Mm -hmm. that have to write a lot. It's only through having a lot of quantity that you can be able to get those 12, 13 poems that for me to even get like 20 poems, I have to write at least 500. That's just my process. And I'm aware that a lot of them won't be good, but that's just how I write. I write a lot of poems and then begin the selection process once I think uh, I have enough. And then even after that selection process, we change the poems a lot and, and add a lot of things. But right. uh, I, I think also the writing process, one cannot choose what process he or she has because I've never sat down and thought about this. It's just the only way that I can get things done is to have a lot and then taken from there hmm. yeah no that that makes good sense to me i yeah um yeah the more the more you write the more the more you put Options. yourself in the space where something can happen yeah um yeah. Yeah. No, thank you very much yeah yeah hey hmm. um maybe just to continue with, with ed's question when do you know that it's done today because it, there's this you know there's this narrative aspect to it it's a there's a there's a there's a plot to it even though it goes you know it's in the present it's in the past and um, I suppose it's not linear in that sense but we can sort of visualize our speaking voice so we, we're kind of tracing his life um, when do you know that that the poem is done that you need to abandon it or do you have to tell yourself okay I'm stopping here or do you feel that, you know, punch uh, to the gut that we get at the end of the poem? Uh, 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 you won't believe. I write poems very quickly. I can't remember writing a poem for more than like 30 minutes or all of them that are in the book. I write very quickly and then I move on to something else and write another. Some days I find myself writing seven or eight so 
and some of them are so good that they just went straight to the book unedited and that's what i said before i write a lot and then i'm aware that six of those i can't even show the world you won't even a grade one child won't write that it's pure just nonsense but i have to write it i write very quickly and sometimes it shocks me when people like the work and all of that because to me, I wrote it long ago and just put it in the drawer. I write another poem, put it in the drawer. By the time I go and check, there are more than a thousand, and then I start the selection process, maybe include other people. They usually pick up poems that I never thought they would pick up when they start. And usually poems I wrote very quick, maybe on a piece of a slip, or that's how I write. And that's how the book was created, but the, the editing process is very different. Uh, I'm influenced by people who, 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 who believe that a, 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 that stage, the editing stage should be longer. And I try to make it as long as it can, as I can. But the writing of the poems themselves, it's just me putting down my ideas and then that, that's how we, uh, I don't know, but I don't put too much thought into it, into the beginning or the ending. It's just as it was the first day I, I wrote it, most of them. Well, that is um, definitely not the common way. It's very yeah. unique and, and special. I wish I, yeah. I wish I had that stamina. Um, and maybe it's not even stamina, it sounds completely spiritual. Um, or do we have any any other questions or comments? There are some some points in the in the chat if you want to um, have a look for yourself. Some mostly praise. If there if there's no other questions or comments, um, I wondered. Yes, I think uh, Robert, okay. Sorry Robert. to interrupt. I think Robert might have had a question. Um, okay. Not sure. So, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, I have read about writers who, you know, they are compelled to write all the time. I mean, uh, and, um, you know, they, they just can't, they can't help themselves. So I just read an interview, American poet John Ashbery he said, said um, it's like the TV's on all the time, you know, as far as he can find. <clears throat> it's stuck, it's stuck in on position and he can't do anything about it. So I mean, it yeah. seems like um uh, Timar is one of these lucky or lucky or maybe unlucky writers, but he's someone who is compelled to write because the words are going through his mind the whole time, you know. That's why he can write eight poems a day and he's been writing since the age of ten or something, you know, at that rate. So he's yeah. he's you know. If I write one poem in a month, I'm, I'm happy, you know, it's like a little sheep's dropping compared to the outpouring of someone like that. So, you know, good. And the fact that he's got the, um, uh, what you call it, the, the sort of reflective ability to like, look at these very fast outpouring of poems and, and decide to actually then go into a long editing process where he assesses them, he throws them out to appear to put a lot of work into ref reflecting on on this huge uh, capacity he has to write is is really a tremendous combination of you know of impulse and reflection and editing which you know he's good luck to him i hope he writes carries on writing and publishing for the rest of his days you know it's fantastic and the writing is extreme the english is extremely clear it's not just straightforward in, in the sense of vocabulary it is straightforward vocabulary but there's something in the way the emotion is coming out in such a powerful way that we've all noticed that um yeah great it's just hope you know he's still a young guy hope it doesn't the ego the ego doesn't get the better of him and he starts thinking he's the greatest poet of all time and all this sort of stuff which is natural when you that age but uh, just keep writing and stick to the truth. You know, I don't think you'll go wrong. So thank you. Thank you. 
thank you. Yeah, it is a compulsion in that uh, I cannot understand anything if I don't write it down. Uh, and the poems that I'm selling people, I usually go back to myself to, to, to understand a certain thing or to understand what happened. So if something is happening now, whether it's love or money or anything, I, I will try to write about it so that I can understand it, whether it, it forms a poem or something. And I always try to come with a solution something that could be read and solve the problem like years from now. If I can write something that if I myself can refer to weeks or months and then it helps me, then that I consider poetry, I can put it in. So I'm selling things that I use myself. I go back to the collection, it helps me. In, it's another person and mm -hmm. I now have a friend I wouldn't sell it if I didn't believe anywhere that is there. So that, that's why I write a lot. I cannot understand anything if I don't write it down. I have to write it and yeah, it's a compulsion for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but thank you. Um, thank you for your honest and your reflective yeah. you. and your powerful um, poems. Um, I think perhaps it's a good time to stop. Um, so what that means is I'm going to stop the recording so I can save to my laptop and then we'll have a short break. I think we can um, reconvene at 8.44. Thank you. Is that right? And um, then we'll open the mic. Um, I hope you, you'll stay for that. You might enjoy it. Okay, thank you, Tim Howe. Maybe let's give him one last round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.